Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar in conversation with James Hunt. My name is Christina Mastoris and I'm the Carer Connect Coordinator at Moira. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land on which you find yourself on today, their elders past, present and emerging, and we welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us online. So we are using Zoom webinar today, which is slightly different to a usual Zoom meeting, which you could probably tell by now. Um, please use the Q&A function, which you can see at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions throughout the presentation. We will have time towards the end to get to your questions. You will also have the option to raise a hand, which is also at the bottom of your screen there. During the Q&A, you can use this if you would like to contribute um, and unmute yourself. A reminder that this webinar will be recorded, um, so everyone who has registered will also receive a copy afterwards. Okay, so we are thrilled to now welcome our special guest speaker and award-winning blogger, James Hunt, all the way from the UK. James is a dad to two boys with autism and shares his everyday insights and experiences on his blog, Stories About Autism. And today he'll be sharing with us too. So welcome, James. Hello, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. And we have to apologise for the time difference. So I think it's, what, 1am <laughs> there? <laughs> it is, yeah, it is 1am. Is so I'll, I'll do my best to... Um, be, be wide awake but um, as I'm sure many of you watching and listening know uh, we're used to, to little sleep in our world and, uh, and, and late night so it's not a problem. Well thank you, thank you for staying up late for us. Um, now we were meant to be doing this in person last year, uh, you were going to fly out to Australia to come and speak to us um, but unfortunately COVID got in the way of that. Yes it did and uh, as well devastated was the was probably the word for me back in March last year um but obviously yeah COVID got in the way and uh I guess this is the the best substitute the best way to uh to make up for it absolutely well yeah we're very excited to be talking to you and to um be able to share this with our care community today as well um did you want to maybe tell us a little bit about you and stories about autism uh yeah sure so I'm uh, like you said I'm I'm a, a dad of two uh, two boys, Jude, who is 12, and Tommy, who's nine. Uh, I've been writing a blog for about five years now, um, sharing stories from our lives. It started just as a way to explain to family and friends, really, what, what life is like. Um, I used to find it quite hard to, to talk about autism and, and some of the, the difficulties and challenges. And for me, it was easier to write it down and and think that that way my friends and family could read it in their sort of, you know, when they've got the time to digest it. And yeah, it, it helped, you know, in, in the first couple of months for them to understand and, and have better conversations with me. And from there, it just seemed to snowball and turn into something a lot more. I've been lucky to, that our stories have been shared all around the world and I get to talk to lots of families and, and and parents and carers from you know from every part of the world and it's led to me doing things like this which is definitely not what I imagined when I first started talking about it but um yeah I'm really glad that's how it's worked out yeah because you have um quite a big following don't you with the blog and across your social media yeah yeah um I think uh about 55,000 on Facebook and 40 something on Instagram so so yeah, which is is crazy, um, but it's it's amazing and it, it's so lovely to uh, you know I get so many messages and, and comments. Um, I, I get I mean loads of nice messages and comments just just about the boys or or about sort of the job I'm doing, but but just to be able to interact with people and and hear their stories as well and and realise we've all got so much in common. Um, no matter where we are in the world, we, you know, autism and, and disability and, and that role of being a parent or carer really connects us. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, 
just that commonality between everybody to be able to see something in uh, someone else and going through the same sort of thing it makes you feel like you're not, you're not just the only one going through it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I, I think it's so important to know that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, well, we get straight into it, I, I guess, because um, one of the first touch points of autism um, is sometimes the initial diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about discovering Jude and Tommy's diagnosis and how that impacted you and your family. Sure. So with Jude, um, I guess the first signs were when he was about, his mum raised it with me when he was about eight or nine months old. Uh, not that she knew it was autism, just that he was probably developing a little bit differently than, than what she expected or what she was seeing from the baby groups and the, you know, the, the families that, that she was meeting. Um, so he was, you know, he was behind on his milestones. He wasn't, you know, was even like from crawling to walking to everything seemed to be quite, quite delayed. Um, he wasn't very sociable with, with other children. He, you know, he didn't really enjoy being around the other babies or, you know, being very interested in what they were doing. Uh, and, you know, for, for me, I uh, sort of just brushed it off and he was about seven weeks premature. So it was the, you know, he's going to catch up. It's just time, you know, he just needs more time. He's a boy, he's lazy. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, so she went to see the doctor. The doctor pretty much said the same thing. And, you know, that put our minds at, at ease a little bit. But, you know, for me, I, I didn't really have the experience to, you know, being around lots of other kids. So, I, you know, I didn't, quite, didn't really see it. Um, whereas, obviously, for her, she was spending time with friends and their babies and, and really noticing the difference. Um, and then, you know, I remember a few months later, we, we went on holiday and we were, we were in France and, and in the, the apartment next door was um, a German couple with, with their child who was, I think she was about three months younger than Jude. And Jude was about 14, 15 months at the time. And this girl was amazing <laughs> she was you know talking and walking and like so intrigued in everything that that he was doing and and you know Jude was there crawling and avoiding her at every opportunity and I think it was that week of you know staying next to them next door to them that just sort of opened my eyes a bit and made me think okay maybe you know maybe there is something a bit different so we you know the, the process in England is you go to the doctor, you get referred on to a paediatrician and then they do an assessment and you get referred on again to like a, a, a team to do a diagnosis. So by then, I think about another six months passed and obviously the word autism had been brought up, but, you know, I, I knew nothing about autism other than, uh, you know, watching the film Rain Man when I was younger, and you know that was that was all I knew. I didn't didn't know much more. Uh, and back then, there wasn't that much available online about it. Like 10, 11 years ago, seems crazy to think that, but everything that seemed to be online was quite professional or medical, and just was a bit overwhelming. You know, not not really being able to take it in. So so yeah, so we went for for the appointment. Um, you have a, a paediatrician, a speech and language therapist, an occupational therapist, and put took Jude through some, you know, play with some toys, do some different tasks. And, it, you know, it, it was clear that everything that I was asking him to do, he, he sort of wasn't interested or wasn't able to. So, so you know, by, by then we, we knew, uh, or again, not really understanding what autism was, but we, we knew we were going to get a diagnosis. And I just remember the, the doctors sort of, you know, bringing us back in the room and, and, and saying, you know, sitting us down and being like very serious and having some leaflets in his hand and just being like, so um, yeah, you know, we, we, we have to inform you that, that Jude has a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. 
and then just sitting back and, and like they all looked at each other and waited as if like who's going to cry or, or scream or, you know, tell them that they're wrong or, you know, just, just shout. And, and yeah, we was just like, okay, so now what, you know, <laughs> what, what next? And we just got given these leaflets and, and sent on our way and, and you just sit and wait and, and, and wait for some support or, or some knowledge or, or something to happen. And I guess that, sort of those first few months after that is sort of the, one of the scariest times you feel I remember feeling like quite lost and just just not knowing what to do really or, or what to do next um and yeah and then you, you know you spend time googling you spend time uh, trying to find out as much information as you can and it feels like you can't learn enough, but then it just feels totally overwhelming. Everything you, you you read, and and I didn't know anybody else who you know had autistic kids, or uh, and it, it just seemed like a real you know like the future was suddenly a, a huge unknown and and just just a real scary prospect. And then uh, near enough three years later to the to the day. Uh, we were going through the same process with Tommy um, and back in that same room and back with uh, some of the same people and, and going through that diagnosis again, which obviously by then we'd had three years of, of sort of trying to get to know and understand what autism is. But I think it's still, you know, it still hits you. It's still um, probably I felt like it hit me a bit harder actually because probably because by then I had a, a better understanding of, of the, the impact it could have on on his life or on, and on our lives uh, because we'd been through three or four years of it with Jude and, and had seen um, what what was happening with him so so yeah so by the time they were both like 20, 18 to 20 months that they, they both had a diagnosis and it was just a, a real sort of anxious scary time yeah absolutely and I think you talk about feeling a bit lost and wondering mm. what's next um and that's you know across the board I think a lot of people struggle with that um particularly if you haven't been around or if you don't know anyone else that has that have kids with autism um yeah. I, did you, I guess you would do, you know, so much research and it's quite overwhelming with the information mm. that you do read up on and you try to grasp to kind of understand everything. Um, was there a point where you felt like you had got your head around things or was it just an ongoing process? I, th I think it's a, it is an ongoing process. Um, I think you, you know, even, even now I, I learn, I learned so much from Jude and Tommy about autism and I, also learn so much from you know other families uh be that online or in person and yeah i, I don't think you ever stop uh, stop learning it it's even but i think because life changes so much uh as life changes for for every child as they you know grow and develop and and i think it's the same you know, it's obviously the same with, with, with our kids, whether they're autistic or not. But but it it just also means that autism might uh, impact their life a little bit differently um, as as they get older, and that, that's definitely been the case for you know if I think back to what they were like at, at two and three compared to to um, how they are now, you know they're, they're very different. So yeah, and because they have quite different needs, don't they, Jude and Tommy? Yeah, yeah. So so Jude. Um, so Jude is nonverbal. Uh, he's very uh, dependent on on me or on his mum or on whoever's you know looking after him. Um, he needs a lot of help with like personal care. He needs um, he needs a lot of guidance, a lot of support, uh, and he you know he he has a lot of sensory issues. He he struggles to to be around other kids, which has got a lot better you know, over the years, you know, from, from when he was much younger to now. 
but life is very managed for Jude. It's very about, you know, trying to keep him in the right environment, not stretching too far, not uh, exposing to too much that, that could be overwhelming. And if you do that, he's the happiest boy. He's so, you know, he's squealing and laughing and giggling and, you know, all day long. And it, he seems to have this effect on people that people just want to care for him and love him. And, and you know, he gives you one smile when people do anything for him. And he just has that, that ability, um, which is pretty fortunate because he needs a lot of, lot of support. Um, he loves music. He's very into uh, Ed Sheeran and Beyonce and uh, all those kinds of, um, kinds of music. I've got him in some old school hip hop as well. So he's, uh, he's got an eclectic taste. Um, he loves trampolining. So he loves that sort of big impact, that bounce, that, that movement. Um, he loves swimming. So obviously the, the last year has been difficult with not being able to do things like swimming and trampolining for him. But so he's been a lot more isolated because for him, like we, we can go out to as much as he loves being outside and loves going to the park and loves, you know, kicking a ball around and just running freely. He, he struggles around noise and he struggles around other kids. So we can be out and a, a toddler comes past and cries and then we've got to go home because he just can't, can't handle it. So, so with Jude, if, you know, if he's very compliant, he's very, you know, if you keep him in, give him what he needs is, is, is like I said, the, the happiest boy around. Um, if you push him too much, he, he really struggles. Um, whereas Tommy, Tommy's a lot more independent, um, very strong-willed, very uh, determined. Um, he's also technically non-verbal, but he, his communication is a lot better um, or a lot stronger than, than Jude's. So um, he uses an, an app called ProLoquo to go and he can, uh, he can request things, he can, um, uh, he, you know, he asked me for like, Dad, I would like Red Book Wolf, which is a little Red Riding Hood book. Um, you know, so he can be quite specific with things, which makes a huge difference because, you know, I, I would never be able to have, have guessed what it is that he wanted, you know, he wants that specific book or that. Um, know specific food whereas Jude is a lot more you can just give him something that you know he'd like and he'd, he'd settle for it whereas Tommy's very specific in what he wants um it's very loud it's very unpredictable uh but he's also a lot more logical he's a lot more into uh he loves learning words and numbers um he loves doing puzzles um he's obsessed with books at the moment and obsessed with bouncing the ball. So the last last year of, of lockdown seems to have uh, developed his ball skills and he's uh, a, almost like a, a mini basketball player in, in waiting. He's constantly bouncing the ball off the walls, the ceilings, the windows, the <laughs> any, any surface he can. Um, but yeah, he's, he's also got a diagnosis of ADHD he uh, also has a tentative diagnosis of Tourette's because he, he's got a lot of tics as well. Um, we're still sort of exploring what that, that means for him. So, so yeah, he, he uh, again, it, it's all about trying to, to meet his needs and, and keep him, although he's able to do a lot more than Jude and experience a lot more of the outside world, um, he's very, very, um, bound by structure and routine like he he knows what day he needs to be doing this and if that changes it can really throw him and upset him um, so yeah it's it's a, it's a balancing act of uh, their, their different needs but you know you, you just figure it out and and do you realize that if you can keep them in a place that they're happy and that they're uh, you know, not anxious and it, it just not only does it help them 
just enjoy their day, but also helps them learn and, and progress. So that that's sort of just what, what I try and do. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think you touched on there, it's, you know, some of the things that help you navigate, um, you know, caring for nonverbal children with mm-hmm. learning disability, with learning disabilities. Um, is there things that work particularly well for, for Jude and, and Tommy that you kind of integrate into your everyday lives? Yeah, so for, for Jude, it's about keeping everything very simple. Um, so I use very limited language with him. So it'd be like, Jude, dinner or, you know, and keeping it that short and so he'll come downstairs for his dinner or, or Jude's splash splash, which he understands is bath. Um, you know, so it's keeping it simple. It's, it's, we also use objects of reference. So if I show him the car key, he knows we're going in the car. If, you know, if we're out in, in the park and he wants to leave, he taps the car key in my pocket and we, we go back to the car. So he uses different objects to sort of help him understand where it is that he's going. So he'll hold on to it until he gets there. And, and that's sort of a, a safety net for him. Um, with Tommy, he really likes, so we've found uh, he, he likes thumbs up for yes, thumbs down for no. So I can say like, um, Tommy, do you want to go to the park? And he'll say like, yes or no, if he's like that. So he's, uh, that's a, a real easy win that, that we've, we've sort of picked up over the years. Um, he also likes um, sort of counting down from five to one. So if we're brushing teeth, if we're washing hair, if we're transitioning from, from one thing to another, it's, you know, okay, we're you know, going to brush teeth for five, four and you know and, and he understands that and responds to that really well and obviously he you know sometimes it's quicker five to one sometimes it's a lot longer but he you know he gets that and we also he also uses it for his routine for where he's going so I have to count out on my fingers what it is that he's going to do so as soon as he wakes up is like in my face going ah, ah, ah. and I'll say that okay breakfast bus school bus daddy's house and then you know that's how he's planned his day then he, he knows what's going on so yeah a combination of, of, of different things um we use some visuals as well for, for tommy um like a visual schedule uh he uses that a lot at school um but but yeah i mean the the, the app for him has, has been amazing because just even his understanding of language has come on so much since then I can I can talk to him a lot more now than, than I could uh, a year or so ago. I can explain to him, and, and I know he understands what those words mean now. So, mm. so that really helps. That's fantastic. And you'd have to be so in tune with you know mm. your child's needs and their communication styles as well, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, and I think you know that, that's one of probably the the biggest things that I learned. Um, probably I don't know five years ago six years ago is I think in the early days we we spend a lot of time trying to change our kids or to make them more into our world and 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 fit into the sort of what we we expect or what we um how they should be be behaving and I actually found going the other way and and learning from them and, and joining them uh, in, in what it is that they do. So, for example, um, to, to help with the whole uh, purpose being, to help get in tune with them and, and build that bond. Um, like Jude used to tap everything. So he used to wander around tapping the radiators, tapping the windows, tapping, you know, and the automatic reaction would be to try and stop him to, to tap, you know, no, don't do that. Let's play with this ball. Let's color. Let's do this. Let's, um, which he had zero interest in, you know, for him, he enjoyed that sensory activity. He, he got something from it that, that made him happy. And so I used to join in with him. I used to sit next to the radiator and, and tap it. And I used to, you know, with no expectations and no, uh, 
you know, demands on him, just just join in. If, if, if he was tapping the windows, I'd wander around tapping the windows as well. And over time, it just increased that bond between us. It's like, instead of me always telling him, no, 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 do this, no, no, do this. It's like, oh, that dad's doing the same thing as me. Like he's enjoying what I'm doing. Um, and it led to him look into me more and, you know, uh, interacting with me more. And over time then not being so uh, sort of anxious if I was to introduce something else, you know, like once we're bonding and tapping then maybe I'll bounce a ball off the wall and see if, you know, he wants to throw the ball and just, just little things like that, that I think watching and our kids and, and observing them rather than, instantly trying to mold them and, and move them in, into what we expect, I think makes a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what about, you know, challenging behaviours? I think mm -hmm. um, many parents and carers can relate to things like meltdowns, violence, even yeah. harm. Um, how yeah. do you go around managing these? Because they can have quite a big impact on your family. Yeah, they can. Um, if I'm honest, that's, that's been the, the hardest thing over the, the last 12 years is, so when, when Jude was about five or six, he, he started self-harm. Um, he had, had no idea what he was doing. I didn't, un, you know, hadn't come across it yet. Hadn't read that part of the autism manual that there was uh, that self-harming was a thing, um, which, you know, one minute he'd be watching the TV, happy as anything, and the next thing is bouncing on his knees on the floor and, and crying, or he'd be, and then it sort of escalated. It would become, he'd jump off the sofa onto his knees, or he'd uh, start slapping the radiator with the back of his hands and then slapping himself and punching himself, and, and it just escalated and escalated. And what started as, like, 10 minutes a day was then 20 minutes a day was then you know, five times a day was waking up in the middle of the night and hitting himself, you know, the first, as soon as he woke up. And for four years, it was horrendous. It was, it was heartbreaking. It was just, you know, the, the, the worst thing imaginable. And it's, it's just not something you, you know, when you become a parent that you imagine you're, you're going to see or, 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 you know, that your child's going to go through. And, and you, you don't know what to do. You, you know, you cry, you shout, you cuddle, you, you try everything you, you can to try and snap them out of, of doing it, but it just, just didn't seem to work. And unfortunately for Jude, one of his biggest triggers was his brother um, because Tommy is loud and unpredictable and that's everything that Jude hates about the world. Um, so we came to realise that you know, even just Tommy being in the same room as him was was uh, was a trigger sometimes. And, and Tommy was just being Tommy. He's just, you know, he's not he's not uh, like being the brother trying to wind him up or trying to, you know, st start an argument with him or anything like that. It just he's just being in the space and being him. And we started having to to you know have one upstairs, one downstairs, and and one at the park, one at home, and one go to see the grandparents and one stay home and and do all these things because it was just you know it was just too too triggering for Jude and and it yeah it, it got really tough for us for for Jude what was a uh, um one of the the real uh, changes was, was medication for him uh that seemed to help uh, decrease his anxiety um and then tied in with a number of other changes it, it seemed to you know like to now he it's very rare for him to, to self-harm which is the biggest relief you know um and it, it it's just it's, it's like a different child it's like a different boy now you know from from that dark period of of going through that each day and and yeah it it does have a huge impact and obviously it makes it hard. Like, how do you concentrate at work when your kids at home self harming? How do you um, go and have a night out with friends when 
your kids at home self-harming you know how, how can you do anything that's fun when when you you're just thinking about that all the time so so yeah it can can have a real real weight and um so when uh me and their mum separated about five years ago uh we decided the best thing to do was to for us to live with one of the boys each so uh so she'll have Jude whilst I have whilst I have Tommy, and then when I've got Tommy, she'll, she'll have Jude, and, and so on. So we swap um, every day or two, and that has made a huge difference. Uh, it gives them the one-to-one -one care that they need, it, uh, and it just stops Jude having to live with Tommy, which which is again an, another thing I never would have thought. You know, when I have two boys that they're living apart, but um, but it, it works, and and you you realise as a as a parent as a carer that when when things are that tough, you you do whatever works, and and that's made a huge difference for him. Um, unfortunately, Tommy then also had a little spell of, uh, or is, still has spells now and again of challenging behaviour, but his is is much more. Um, violent out outwardly so he'll be destructive he'll lash out at me or at his mom um rather than himself which uh again is, is you know like a, a different thing to deal with but uh again luckily that touch wood seems to be a lot more under control these days um tommy's also had medication because of his behaviors because of his ADHD because of you know just again to try and reduce the anxiety and 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 allow him to uh to function at a, a, a better level and and you know so he's not always up here is is you know more more stable um and again yeah it's 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 made a, a big difference and when you go through that, when you go through such a long period of self-harm or the violent behaviours, and I mean, it, like I said, it, it takes its toll on you personally, but then you you realise just what's important in life. You realise that, you know, you in that moment, you'd give anything for that behaviour not to, not to exist and not to happen. And you would, you know, just any mundane, boring day would be amazing compared to to, to going through that so so yeah luckily as I say at the moment we have much less bad days and well we have much more good days and bad days um so so yeah it seems to be seems to be working yeah that's amazing it's so interesting how much you've had to tailor um you know your lives around the different needs and having the two boys um you know live separately most of the time um we had a question that came through actually which touched on that um, about you know how they communicate with each other, um, mm -hmm. and do they get to they still get to spend time with each other? I would imagine. <laughs> uh, at the moment, very little to be honest. Um, only it's kind of only when we have to, like when there's no choice, uh, because it is it's so difficult. Um, it's also difficult because, like for me, if if I've got both of them, then it, it's just me and and two of them. Uh, and when I have done it here, it's it's just trying to keep them apart, you know, one upstairs, one downstairs, and and which Jude is quite happy with, but then Tommy will run upstairs, so Jude will come down, and then you know it, it's just that that's all you do. And, and again, it, it's fine for a day, or it's fine for you know if you're doing that all day every day. There's it's not you know the sort of quality of life for them that 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 they need. Um, we were working on it with school, um, with integrating them and with, uh, you know, so they, they go to the same school, uh, with trying to get them like into the soft play area together, get them into the playground together. Um, but again, COVID has, has sort of put pay to all of that um, because at school they have to stay in their bubbles and, you know, the classes can't mix and so on. Um, but uh, yeah it's it's something that we're going to be working on um mm. but right now it's it's just yeah it's just not possible yeah and that's right you know you do what works um the best for you and your family at that time just to get through yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and I mean, you know, you probably wouldn't have envisioned this in having to separate the two boys right from the beginning. Um, and I guess there are, you know, hopes and dreams and worries that all parents have for their children. Um, but what do these look like for you, I guess, as a parent to, you know, with special needs children? Yeah. So uh, I think for, like you say, all, all, all parents have hopes and dreams and, and, and what you imagine. And then, yeah, it's, it's been very different. You know, like I imagined we'd be going on family holidays. I imagined we'd be going to family occasions and parties and, you know, playing sport at the weekend and, you know, going to the cinema, going, you know, all those sorts of things. And, and very little of them have happened or they're, they're very, you know, very rare that we ever get to do those things. So I think for a while, it's, it almost felt like the hopes and dreams stopped, which is, is not a nice way to live. It's not, you know, uh, but it felt almost too painful to, to imagine, you know, because I, I don't know if my boys will ever talk. I don't know if they'll ever have a friend, you know, that, that sort of thing. So I think that there was a period there where it was just, it felt too much to even, you know, dream that they'd talk because they're going to be disappointed and it's another thing that's not going to happen. And so, yeah, so I, I, I mean, now, yeah, I've, I, I feel, you know, I'm in a much better place. So I do sort of have hopes and dreams for the future, but they're, they're largely tied into just seeing them happy. And uh, yeah, there, there's some, some sort of milestones I'd love them to hit like of course I'd, I'd love them to be able to talk I'd love I'd love but then I'd break it down and say I just love them to be able to communicate better uh, I'd love uh, Jude to be able to take a lot more personal care of himself um, and and that be something that you know we can well we are working on but that we we get through in the next couple of years because he's becoming a teenager now and soon he'll be a man and and you know it's, it's not something you'd imagine that you're still doing for your son at uh, 18 or you know 25 or whatever um but I think what helps me is is staying quite in, in the short term and not going too far ahead because I think the too far ahead is quite scary. Um, like trying to imagine what they're going to be like as adults is, uh, you know, feels like mind blowing at the moment. Like uh, uh, I don't know what's what's going to be available. I don't know, you know, what they're going to be like in in five years or, or ten years. So it's let, letting my mind wander that far ahead. I, I think is is not a uh, isn't the best thing to do. Um, but I guess the worries are, you, I think as a, as a parent of special needs kids, you're, you're always worrying that you're always worrying that you're doing the right thing, that are you doing the right therapy? Are you, you know, should you be doing more? Should you uh, be trying these supplements that are amazing? Should you, uh, are they going to the right school? Are they, uh, you know, should you be doing therapy on the weekends? Should you be forcing them to go and try these things? Like, it, it's. I think you're always doubting your your choices. You're always um, just worrying if you've done the right thing, and and I think that can can eat away at you at times, and 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 make you just just doubt yourself constantly, and. And make us feel guilty like that we're we're not doing a, a good enough job even you know you might know deep down that really that you are but you, you feel like someone else would be doing it better so and i guess the, the biggest fear is is uh who's going to look after them when if i'm sick or if when i'm not around anymore like what what's going to happen to them then if if they still need a high level of care like who is it that's that's gonna gonna look after them? So 
but like I said, for, for me, I, I, I sort of work really hard to try and not let my mind wander that, that far ahead and, and stick to the next month, the next few weeks and, and sort of the, the smaller things that we're working on and, and hoping that that come true. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not, it's definitely not easy. And I think there's so much expectation there that sometimes you have to put aside and you have to work on that um, for yourself. And you've touched on some of, you know, those challenges. Um, yeah, but I mean, as a carer, and I think a lot of carers um, face those, parents and carers face those challenges. Um, it's definitely not always easy. Um, what are your sort of personal challenges that you feel like you have to work through? Um, well, I, I think what one I mentioned already was guilt is, is that feeling of, you know, am I good enough? Am I doing enough? Could I, I should have handled that better. They had a meltdown if I'd have, they wouldn't have had a meltdown if I'd have handled that better. Um, so I think that's, that's always there. Um, I think isolation is, is a big thing for, for me and for, for many carers. Uh, you know, there are, I always imagined I could just go to family's houses when I wanted or go to a friend's house with my kids and, and go and, and socialize and spend time with people, but it's, it's not that simple. Um, most of the time we have to stay at home. Um, and, and miss out on those occasions so I think you know, yeah the isolation is a big thing um, I think coping with the anxiety of uh, even when things are going well you you sort of got a constant anxiety of oh, if what if he has a meltdown today what if uh, it could go wrong at any minute um, <laughs> I've got a so for, for Tommy, he has zero danger awareness. Like, you know, he, he runs off in any direction at any given moment. And every Saturday morning, we go for a walk um, along the river from my, you know, we can walk from my house to the river and we go and just get him through those four or five streets, which are pretty quiet, to be honest, there's not much traffic, but at any second I know he could try and burst across the road, which he has done in the past. So you're just on edge that whole time. And it's supposed to be this enjoyable thing because he loves it. He loves going for the walk and, and, but the whole way there, just, I just got to get him to keep him safe. I just got to keep him safe. And you know, you, you're like, so it just builds up this, this whole anxiety in you. Um, is a lack of sleep. <laughs> Is a big one for for, for carers. Um, to be honest, I'm I'm luck com, compared to years ago. Uh, sleep is a lot better now, but I mean there was you know a good few years of three four hours a night every night um, and very broken sleep. But it's getting better as they're getting older. Hoping they're going to become lazy teenagers and and sleep in a bit. Um, so, but obviously when that happens day after day after day and you never feel like you have the time to catch up on sleep or you do get a bit of free time and you feel like you shouldn't be using it to sleep because free time is so precious and you need to go and socialize or you need to go and do something for you. And so, so yeah, I think, I think lack of sleep is a big one. And lastly, I was going to say uh, comparison I think it's really natural and a hard thing not to do is to look at other people, uh, be that friends and family or just, you know, people on social media, people uh, who you pass in the street and compare your kids or compare their, your lives to, to theirs. Um, I get it. I, I had it on uh, Sunday. I was at the park with Tommy and it, it happens very you know it, it's got a lot less now he's as years have gone by I, I don't think about these things very often but for some reason on Sunday we was at the park and he'd had a tricky time and we were we, we went to the sand pit and he's sitting there flicking the sand around it's great fine it's, it's helping him regulate and at that moment uh, a big group of kids turned up for rugby practice of, of Tommy's age 
and they're you know running to play rugby and I'm watching him flick the sand and they're running in to play rugby and then to the to the other side it was like a, a toddler football game going on and there I can I could just hear them and they're you know following instructions and doing all the games and playing I'm thinking like Tommy couldn't do that and that like he wouldn't follow those instructions or or get involved like that and I saw a couple of people that I knew and their kids you know and just parents standing on the sidelines chatting and having it and you just think that's how easy it, it might have been or that you know that that feeling comes back and I, I hate feeling like that it's, it's not a nice feeling but but every now and again it, it creeps back in and and but luckily as I say over the years it happens less and when it comes you d- I deal with it a lot better and a lot you know it lingers for a few minutes and it's gone and you get back to to sort of focusing on the good that you do have mm. yeah I mean it's it's not easy to kind of let that mm. go um mm. and you sort of you touched on that over time, you've been able to work on that. Um, how did you get to the point where you can, you know, notice that um, and get over it quite quickly? Because I think a lot of parents struggle with that as well. Yeah, I, time is 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 a big thing. You know, I've been doing this for nearly thirteen years now, and it it has gotten easier. Um, and I, I think just realizing that. I think a lot of the time we feel those emotions and then we feel guilty about them straight away. And we, you know, beat ourselves up for, for thinking like that or feeling like that. And I think even if we manage to stop that, that seems to allow these things to pass more quickly. Like, you know, like, yeah, I, I, I definitely compared and felt a bit sad on Sunday, but I didn't then, go, Oh, you shouldn't be feeling sad. You, you know, and sort of get down on myself at the same time. Um, and I guess just, just, you know, trying to focus on, on some of the good things and realizing that, you know, what one thing Jude and Tommy have taught me is to, to see the beauty and, and really appreciate the, the small things and, you know, every smile and every little accomplishment that they, that they manage is huge. And if you can fill yourself with those moments, then you can, sort of try and stop focusing on the on the ones that you imagine that you're not having yeah but it's it's not easy I mean there's no you know secret method that that allows you to do it unfortunately yeah and I think you're right you know children have a great way of kind of bringing it back to that moment and it is finding Mm. those little things um little moments of happiness and bringing it back to you know basic gratitude really um and there is an element of, you know, self-care in that and trying not to linger on those negative emotions. Um, what works for you? How do you look after yourself to, to keep going and keep energised and keep being resilient? Yeah. Um, I mean, I 100% agree. I think self-care is so important. And I think as carers, we neglect it massively. Um, there's a quote that I love that says... Um, taking care of yourself doesn't mean um, me first, it means me too. And I think that is so important because, you know, our, our kids have complex needs and, and need a lot of care and a lot of energy from us. And sometimes we feel like, you know, how can we work on ourselves or focus on ourselves when we've got to, to, to spend all our energy and, and time looking after them and then feel guilty if we, take some time off to 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 do the things that we need to do but you know just as adults we we have things that we you know we're not made to be a 24 7 carer we we have our own needs that that need to be met and yes it's difficult it's difficult to find the time number one is is a huge you know problem finding the time but it doesn't always mean it has to be something that you know I don't have to have six hours off to to self-care I can have 15 minutes or you know like I try and focus on every day having at least 15 minutes to do something so whether that's read a book whether that's watch tv whether that's you know go online and and most days it's more than that 
you know, but I, you know, there's always, even if it's just at the end of the day when they've gone to sleep, like, right, I'm just going to have 15 minutes to me now. So something has, has happened in that day. So obviously we're, we're at home a, a lot, you know, before COVID, there's no, no real difference in that. Um, so movies, box sets uh, and, and books are a, a big thing. Um, exercise is for me, you know, just movement, doing something. Um, so whether that, again, whether that's 10, 15 minutes at home doing a hit workout or something, or whether that's going for a walk or going to the gym for a, you know, a longer time, it, it, I don't know if, if I do some kind of exercise two, three times a week, it makes a huge difference to how I feel. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'd love to see people more. <laughs> I'd love to see friends and family more. I don't get the opportunity as much as I'd like to, but when I do, then that, you know, charges me up, that refuels me almost. But I've, I guess the, the, the biggest constant is, uh, is my blog, is the community that I've, you know, managed to, to gain from that. And that, you know, keeps me going each day, that I, it's introduced me to so many people um, who are, are now friends. Uh, and it helps me, you know, I mean, I, I don't feel alone anymore. I'm, I'm a single dad. I'm at home most of the time by myself with my boys, but I don't feel alone because there might be someone in Australia, might be someone in America, might be someone, you know, 10 minutes away, but I'm talking to them online and I'm, I know that, that they get what's happening in my day and, and I get what's happening in their day and that makes such a difference. And whether it's just, you know, asking a question like, oh, has your son ever done this? Like, what do you do when, when this happens? Or whether it's just talking about something completely non-autism related, you know, you've just got that connection that, that really helps. So, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in, in that, through the blog that it's given me that and I'm really passionate about trying to help others you know it's why I'm you know my inbox is, is hugely full of messages but I do my best to try and get back to people because I know within there's lots of lovely just genuine nice comments but within there somewhere is someone who's asking you know for help or asking for because they're, they're struggling and I know what that's like so for me you know even just just doing that help you know takes my mind off maybe my tough day and what's going on and and helps me uh focus on the good yeah absolutely i think connection is so important isn't it mm. um especially with other people that are in the same boat or going through similar experiences um because you do have that uh level of understanding as well um mm. and not feeling so alone and isolated because there are lots of other people out there you know, in the same position. So yeah. it definitely yeah. helps to, to talk about it and to reach out for help when you need it um, is also yeah, so important. It's so important. I, you know, I, I hear it all the time from people who um, they, they just don't know where to turn and their friends and family don't understand and and they feel like they've got no one to, to talk to and you know, I'm, I'm always happy for people just to message me and I always say, you know, just unload, just put it all down. And, you know, if I can help in any way, great. Or I can try and, you know, I always advise, you know, if you looked for local Facebook groups to see if there's people who live near you and, and often they haven't because they just haven't thought to do that because they're in crisis or they're in, you know, they're, they're, you don't always uh, think of these things until someone tells you. So, so yeah, having, having a community is, is so important. Absolutely. And there is so, I mean, we're quite lucky because there are so many options now to connect with yeah. parents yeah. And, and carers. And I think, you know, it does, it's almost on the last of your list of sometimes because you are trying to organise, you know, appointments for the kids, whether it be mm. speech pathologist or OT or whatever it is. And it's not until you realise, actually, I need to talk to someone for myself or connect with other people yeah. just as a parent or as a carer. Um so there's definitely lots of options there um, to connect with people. Mm. Yeah. 
Um, I, you did mention COVID and most of us have been through COVID um, and lockdowns and things, and it's still definitely ongoing, but it has had a prolonged and significant impact over there in the UK, more so than here in Australia. Um, how did you guys cope with that? Um, and how did Jude and Tommy adjust to the changes? I don't know how we cope, to be honest. <laughs> we had, um, so, so yeah, it's obviously it's very different here than, than uh, where you guys are. Um, I mean, thankfully, none of us got sick or none of us have got sick. Um, and, and so we, we escaped in that sense. But for us, like there was a, I'd say nearly four months from March. So from March to July of no school, no carers, no, no support, you know, it's all gone overnight. So yeah, I, I didn't have a minute off from like March to, to July. And, and obviously the boys lost their structure, their routine, their, you know, everything they get from school each day. And, you know, trying to work somehow trying to look after the boys and and all with everything closed and you're not allowed to go anywhere you're not allowed to do anything and so we'd go out once a day for a walk and then we'd go out once a day for a drive and that was it and luckily we had some freakish weather for like that time of year and so we was in the garden a lot and to, to be honest they when it first happened, I thought it was going to be hell. Like I, I really did. And both Tommy and Jude coped a lot better than I thought they would. Um, I, I don't know why or how, but they just seemed to, after a f sort of, I think after a few weeks, they kind of just settled into it as this is our new routine now. Like this is what we do each day. Um, so yeah, it, it was, and yeah, obviously not being able to see people, not being able to, uh, go and see family not you know for so I was able to to go and see my mum and dad because I'm a single parent and I sort of do some caring for them as well uh, but I didn't want to take the boys in there because they're elderly and you know I didn't want to risk the the chance of you know at least with me going in there I could keep my distance I could you know, wear a mask, I could do those things and like drop their shopping off and do that sort of stuff. But I couldn't take the boys in there. And I'm like, well, how do I do this? You know, how do I look after them and look after them? And it was, yeah, it was a crazy few months of, then it, we got a couple of weeks of school before the summer holidays. Then we had summer holidays. Then we went back in September. Then we had another lockdown then it opened up again. Then we had a lockdown from December or from January. The day before school was about to start, they changed their mind and did another lockdown. And so, yeah, no school from Jan or a part time school from January to sort of March time. And yeah, now it looks like we're by next month, everything's open and, and as, as usual. Um, but for us, it's just full-time school is, you know, if, 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 everything, if everything else in the world is shut, the school is open, I can, yeah. I can cope. But, uh, yeah, I don't know how, but we, we got through four months of no school. So. Uh, yeah, you did an amazing job. I think a lot of people, um, yeah, struggled through it as well and yeah. got through it. So, I mean, um, what, what choice do you have, right? There's, there's nothing, nothing else you could do. There's no carers couldn't come in and help. There's no... No, yeah. Got no choice. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, so glad to hear that things are getting better yeah. over yeah. there. Um, we might open up to some questions now. Yeah, sure. um, just going to. We did have a question here from Sally. Um, what therapies, if any, do you have for the boys? Okay, so the boys have. Most of their therapy is through school. So their their school has a speech and language therapist. So they they will set a program with the with the teacher and that will be implemented in their sort of 
you know daily school life whatever it is that they're working on will, will be you know whether that's uh arts whether that's through you know literacy numbers whatever it is they're doing the, the speech and language element is, is always in there um they have occupation they have an occupational therapist so again they've got a, a sensory room in the school or a couple of sensory rooms in the school uh so they'll put together a, a sort of sensory diet and for you know for each child in the school and, and try and again work that into their, their daily daily uh, routines so like tommy will have movement breaks during his lessons he'll be able to go outside and you know run around for a bit and then come back in um jude uh will use like a trampoline or the therapy swing um but yeah, other than that, there's, there's not really um, any sort of regular therapy that, that they have. Okay. Um, and Claudia, I'm just going to, you got your hand up there. So I'm going to unmute you if you wanted to ask your question. Are you there, Claudia? We might come back to Claudia. Um, we have another one here. How do you decide if your child should go to a mainstream school or an autism specialist school? Okay. Uh, yeah. So for us, it. So when when Jude was was first, uh, you know, we, we were first looking at schools for Jude. Um, we we went and looked at both. Um, when I looked at mainstream, when I looked at spe special needs school and just tried to imagine Jude in, in each scenario. Um, it was clear, not that we really knew it back then, that special needs school was the right route for him. Um, but again, at, at that stage, we, you know, we, we had no idea. So it was only really by going to look around the schools and seeing sort of what the mainstream schools offered for uh, autistic kids or here you have something called a, a EHCP, an educational health care plan. So that's for, for kids with additional needs. Um, and then in a mainstream school, they'll have, um, it's a document that, that then will detail what, extra support they'll provide for for that child and it, it just didn't feel right it, you know when when we went and looked around mainstream we just it, it didn't you know especially he was nonverbal, he was still in nappies he all those kinds of things and you just felt like I, I can't see him fitting in here and luckily um we had a choice of, of two special needs schools and completely fell in love with with one of them uh and and yeah they've just been amazing ever since and then for, for Tommy we went through the same thing and Tommy I, I actually thought he would go to mainstream school um because he was so different to Jude and he seemed so much more academic uh and we even deferred him for a year because we thought he might end up in mainstream um but again when when it got to that time and, and we went and had a look again at all the different options uh, we ended up sending him to the, the same one as, as Jude where you know for we just I think because we'd only seen it through the eyes of Jude or through that lens we, and Tommy was so different we just didn't appreciate how actually it's the perfect fit for Tommy as well yeah and but, um uh, yeah, so I just say you go with your gut you go with you know it's you see all the options talk to them go back and see them again and just just go with where you think your, your child's going to fit and and sometimes it's not the right choice and and you'll move and you'll go from mainstream to special needs or go from special needs to mainstream and, yeah. and it, there's no perfect option in, in the first choice yeah that's right um yeah it's finding the right fit isn't it and sometimes it takes some time mm. to get to that point um I guess, do you have any um, resources or websites or books and things that you have been a go-to for you that you could share with us? 
Uh, so books, I always say um, the reason I jump. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've, you've seen that book or uh, it's actually, there's a film coming out um, about it as well. Basically it's, uh, it's written by a, a non-verbal autistic, uh, I think he's a teenager now. I think he was about 11 or 12 when he, when he first wrote it. Um, but I found that fascinating. He communicates with a, um, with a, a touch board, you know, and he, he's written this book and explains so much of how he feels and why he does certain things and, and how he, you know, reacts in certain ways. And, and I really found that really helpful. Um, around the sort of uh, self-harming and, and challenging behaviours, there's a, a really good um, Facebook page and group called the Send VCB Project, uh, which they've got lots of videos, uh, lots of um, advice about how to, to cope with, with challenging behaviour. And then they've also got a, a private Facebook group where there's, you know, thousands of parents um, who, you know, it's just a chance for you to, to offload and, and offer advice and, and realise again that you're not alone. Because I think with that sort of behaviour, you really do feel alone because it's, it's very often, or it's very rarely spoken about. Um, I, I know when it first happened with Jude, it, I, you know, it was the most shocking thing I'd ever, ever experienced and, and didn't think that anyone else was going through it. Well, clearly they do. Uh, so yeah, I always recommend that, that website as well. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, I guess, yeah, finally, do you have a, um, any messages or anything to leave us with for today? Um, just, uh, I, mean, I mean, I think it's great that obviously the, the work that, that Moira does to sort of connect parents and carers. And I just, I really recommend to, to everyone watching and listening to embrace that and whether that's um, through Moira, whether that's through you know, school, a local Facebook group, uh, you know, whatever it is, find a community and, and become a part of it. It's just having, even if you've got one person who you can have a coffee with, who you can message, who just has a life very similar to yours and just understands it, um, it, it makes such a difference. Like I, when, not long after Jude's diagnosis, I met um, through a friend of a friend, uh, a couple who had an autistic kid who is two years older than Jude. And I've learned so much from them over the years because they'd been, they were already going through the process. They'd already experienced things and could just pass little snippets down and, and advice. And it, it just made such a difference. It, it really does. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, we'll share after, once we share the recording with everybody, um, we'll include some links to um, some groups, support groups or online groups or Facebook groups as well, um, you know, if you're interested in, in joining. But, um, yeah, we find that there's so much value in talking to other parents and carers, like you mm -hmm. said, just getting those everyday tips or those experiences um, that they can pass on to you because they've been through it, they know what's happening, or even just to sit there and, like I said, have a coffee and have a chat to someone um, who understands. So, yeah, super important. Um, and I, I might be on the other side of the world, but my inbox is always open. So uh, if ever you, you've got something to ask, just send me a message. Oh, thanks, James. Um, well, we might leave it there and probably let you get to bed <laughs> because it's quite <laughs> late there. Um, but we really can't thank you enough for joining us today and sharing your story with us exclusively for Moira. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you. And hopefully, um, you know, we'll definitely connect with you on stories about autism through your Facebook page and then Instagram yeah. as well. And we'll share those links with everyone as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. I've been really enjoyable. Really, really liked it. And yeah, I hope it's been of some help for all of you out there in Australia. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And um, we'll see you again next time. Bye.